Uh, good morning. This is our final reporting session of the workshops which were held yesterday. Uh, I have an initial list here, and I would request that all the persons reporting in stick to the time limit, uh, which has been indicated to them. In any case, the reports of the workshops, if they're prepared in the template, will be available on the website. Uh, the first one I have is Sekh Maktar of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, who will uh, report an African group meeting and the Kigali recommendations. Uh, may I suggest that people uh, speak as possible, uh, come quickly to a podium and go down or speak from the floor just to save some time. Is there somebody with a mic around here? Uh, mic. Hmm? Or for the moment, just come to the podium and you can speak from the podium. Yeah. yeah. Can I request uh, 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 Susie Strubble of the Dynamic Coalition on Open Standards? I'm Susie Struble, representing the Dynamic Coalition on Open Standards, or DCAUSE. Our mission is to provide government policymakers and other stakeholders with useful tools to make informed decisions to preserve the current open architecture of the internet and the World Wide Web, which together provide a knowledge ecosystem that has strongly shaped the multiplier effect of global public goods and improved economic and social welfare. I also represent Sun Microsystems. Our multi-stakeholder coalition was pleased to hear the problems in ICT standards discussed often this year from the opening discussion panel to yesterday's panel on openness. We believe these discussions will lead to greater understanding of a system that has profound power over what we can and cannot do with ICTs and will ultimately lead to better decision making about what changes, if any, need to be made. So we hosted three sessions this year and we also participated in the A2K Coalition's workshop yesterday afternoon. Our first workshop on Monday focused on the intersection between open ICT standards, development, and public policy. Our panelists spoke of the economic aspects of interoperability, as well as existing and new activities in WIPO that are related to the issue of standards and intellectual property, such as the new development agenda and the new work on the Standing Committee on Patents. They also spoke of how the new trend of bilateral free trade agreements, which are often broader in their IP protection requirements than, say, WTO TRIP, could cause problems, and this is certainly an issue for policymakers to understand. There was also some discussion of potential exceptions and limitations to intellectual property law, such as for reverse engineering under copyright and patent law for the purposes of ensuring interoperability in a system in which the economic network effect is so strong. The European Committee on Interoperable Systems presented on the role of that competition law and policy can also play in promoting ICT interoperability. Panelists also discussed the political dimension of standards, how technical standards often actually set policy. And if you don't have a seat at the table, um, well, most ICT standards in the world are, are actually created by private industry consortia, just as the Business Software Alliance representative pointed out yesterday when he said, and I quote, BSA members are responsible for the development of the open standards, all the technology standards that exist today. You know, that might not be the worst model, this, this, this private consortium model, but are there characteristics that these organizations and their output should have that would give them appropriate legitimacy? And our last panelist presented on the need for every IGF co dynamic coalition to include promoting accessibility in its work, and that's something certainly our coalition will do uh, and, and will report back next year. ICT standards should have accessibility principles built in from the beginning, and I think the W3C, who we heard from, provides a ni nice model that, as I said, our, our coalition will explore more. And then our second meeting was a working meeting of the coalition on Tuesday that actually turned more into a repeat of our Monday general session, but we did spend more time there talking about capacity building for developing economies and the public interest in ICT standards setting. And we heard how the IETF attempts to address this problem of getting more developing economies engaged um, with a, uh, a um, a kind of scholarship fund, and I think their model and others are something the coalition will also explore over the next year. 
And finally, on Tuesday afternoon, we held a best practices workshop in which the government of Sri Lanka and a representative of the Extremadura region of Spain spoke about how their e-inclusion programs relied upon open standards and why and what they meant when they said open, what were those criteria for that output, that standard, and what policies, such as government procurement, in the case of Sri Lanka, were put in place to support greater competition, greater access, and lower costs. And for anyone who wants to get more involved in the Dynamic Coalition, we invite you to visit our website which, and join the mailing list, and all that is at www.igf-dcos.org. And thank you for your time. Uh, can I to ask David Satola, of, uh, who is reporting on the workshop on governance frameworks for CIR? Thank you and good morning. Uh, uh, may I request that you are short of time, but yep. speak at a pace at which it can be translated. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'm David Satola from the World Bank, and I'm reporting back on our workshop on governance frameworks for critical internet resources. On behalf of our 15 organizers, seven panelists representing five continents, I would like to thank our hosts for the courtesies extended and the facilities provided, and for, to thank the Secretariat and the advisory group for their support and assistance uh, in our workshop. We had about 130 people attending our workshop, uh, which we were delighted about. In terms of the substance that we covered, our focus was to explore frameworks or methodology for approaching governance issues on critical internet resources. First, we looked at what critical internet resources are to provide a baseline. Then we looked at what principles should be used in analyzing what governance features should be. After having set the foundation, we then started to look at a methodological approach to governance issues. And then started to look at what might be the case in the future. What are the dynamic factors affecting governance going forward? We then postulated some new approaches based on our analysis of the dynamic factors about how to address governance issues in the future. One of the recommendations was a proposal for a commons-based domain for global public goods. Our report on the workshop uh, is being submitted to the Secretariat, so you can see in more detail there the interventions of the various speakers, as well as, we hope, a link to the presentations that were made. We look forward to exploring these issues in more detail at upcoming Internet Governance Forum. And again, thank you very much. May I request Mr. Sekmak Tar of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I will speak in French, please. Le, je vais faire rapidement le point de, de la réunion du groupe Afrique qui s'est tenue sur initiative de la Commission économique des Nations Unies pour l'Afrique le mardi dernier sous la présidence de son Excellence Monsieur le ministre algérien chargé des postes et télécommunications. L'objectif euh, principal de cette réunion était d'analyser le rôle joué par le continent dans les discussions de la gouvernance d'Internet et aussi en particulier les discussions au niveau local et régional et d'identifier aussi les priorités et préoccupations de l'Afrique dans les questions traitées dans la gouvernance Internet et aussi de préparer la participation de l'Afrique aux prochaines IGF, c'est-à-dire euh, New Delhi 
et le cœur qui doit se dérouler en Afrique. Beaucoup d'intervenants ont pris la parole et à la suite des différentes discussions, il a été retenu d'approfondir la réflexion et de faire une étude, une, un benchmark, benchmarking sur les TIC en Afrique pour voir au niveau de l'accès, au niveau de la sécurité, au niveau des ressources critiques, au, au, au niveau des sécurité, ressources critiques, accès, contenu, qu'est-ce qu'il y a en Afrique, quelles sont les forces et les faiblesses des différents pays, pour pouvoir décrire une ligne directrice en matière de bonne gouvernance Internet pour le continent africain. Ah, dans la réunion aussi, on a pu présenter les réunions de la, les recommandations de la conférence de Kigali, du sommet de Kigali sur Connecté Afrique. Donc, ces recommandations étaient axées sur quatre points, sur les infrastructures et réseaux d'accès, sur le renforcement des capacités, sur les services contenus et applications et sur le cadre réglementaire. Donc, je vais rapidement vous lire euh, au niveau des infrastructures. Il a été recommandé d'amener tous les pays africains qui n'ont pas contribué au Fonds de solidarité numérique de le faire, de recourir au partenariat public-privé pour la mise en œuvre des projets, en particulier dans la gouvernance Internet, et, et adopter des politiques réglementaires souples. Au niveau du renforcement des capacités, accorder la priorité au développement des compétences en quantité et en qualité suffisantes et intégrer pleinement l'éthique dans l'éducation, mettre en place des centres d'excellence dans chaque sous-région, au niveau du service et contenu, assurer le développement du contenu en langue locale, c'est-à-dire promouvoir la diversité culturelle. Au niveau du cadre politique et réglementaire, procéder à la révision des cadres réglementaires de régulation, assurer le renforcement des capacités pour les régulateurs et créer des points d'échange Internet internationaux et régionaux. Voilà, M. le Président, le fruit des travaux de notre session, sachant que le la recommandation principale qui est sortie de nos travaux, c'est l'élaboration de ce bench benchmarking qui sera élaboré par la CIA en, en collaboration avec l'Union africaine. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Uh, my, the next uh, report is from Henry Judy on the old report on the best practices forum on data breach uh, notification. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Henry Judy. I'm with the American Bar Association. Uh, we held a best practices forum yesterday on the subject of data breach notification and consumer protection. We reviewed developments in the law on that subject globally, and we literally walked through the design of uh, an ideal uh, statute on the subject. Uh, we um, explored the connection of the subject to the themes of access, uh, of security, uh, and um, development, and um, we noted that uh, literally the day before uh, our uh, session, uh, the European Union announced a draft new directive on the subject. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have on our panel uh, a, um, a member of uh, the European Parliament and uh, a member uh, of Parliament from the uh, United Kingdom who is able to address uh, this new directive and we were even more fortunate to have in the audience uh, a member of the United Kingdom House of Lords who um, was a principal uh, author of a report of uh, the House of Lords on um, uh, personal security uh, and in particular on this subject. So we had a very rich discussion and a very timely and pertinent discussion on the subject uh, and we look forward in the future to more detailed discussions and a connection of this subject to broader uh, and more uh, lateral subjects of uh, uh, personal uh, security 
on the internet uh, and its connection to the themes of the conference. Thank you very much. Uh, I now have uh, Wolfgang Kleinwachter on the broadening of the domain name space. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter from the University of Aarhus. I was, uh, together with five other organizations, the convener of a workshop in the critical internet resources on broadening the domain name space, top-level domains for city, regions, and continents. Um, it was the first summit of uh, projects of TLDs existing in emerging projects of top-level domains which has a reference to a geographic name, city, region or uh, something else. And uh, we started with a presentation of three existing top-level domains, .eu, .asia and .cat for Catalonia. And then we had the presentation of uh, emerging projects, which included uh, cities, regions, and continents. It was done dot .nyc for New York City, dot .berlin, dot .paris, dot .sim for Wales, dot uh, .gal for Galicia, uh, dot .btn for the Britannia, and uh, dot .mercosur for a group of Latin American countries, dot lat also for latin american countries and dot africa and then we had a discussion um, about makes it sense or not to have a such kind of new top level domains in the process of the introduction of new gtld we heard comments you know from the uh, user community the individual users and the business users and um, then we had a nice discussion with uh, members from the audience. We had around 130 people in the room. And the three messages from the um, uh, workshop are, one, um, there is a growing wave of projects, you know, uh, for new top-level domains which have a geographical element in it. And this is seen as a new opportunity for global cultural branding and for the stimulation of um, new uh, local um, uh, business and for giving the consumer more choices. Number two, GeoTLDs would enrich the domain name system, would uh, introduce a new element in the DNS and would give uh, users more choice and the third message is the third message is I can should speed up its procedures and to open the door for the accreditation of new GTLDs as soon as possible and to include GTLDs into this process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I now have Mr. Tomohiko Yamakawa uh, on a workshop on international cooperation in the capably building for information security. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to report a workshop on international cooperation on the capability building of information security, representing four organizers, um, JPSAT-CC, ISOC, GIPI, and Nippon Keidanren. We have one moderator from JPSAT-CC and six panelists Two are from business organizations, Nippon Keidan Ren and ITAA. Two from Information Society, GIPI and AFRINIC. And two from CSAT communities, one from Brazil, and the other one is also the representative of the government of Vietnam, Southeast Asia. First of all, we discussed what is the issue for information uh, security's capacity and capability building. It was pointed out that the uh, uh, lack of national CSAT and uh, some solutions are not available for all regions. In this sense, uh, this um, building a national point of contact would be a good solution for the information security. But uh, most panelists have pointed out not only for the incident response capabilities, uh, CSAT, not only CSAT, but 
involving uh, many other issues as uh, information security capacities. For example, legal framework, critical infrastructure protection, business involvement, and especially in the perspective of user protections and user perspectives. And finally, at the end of the discussion, moderator proposes the panelists and audience to try any proposed solutions and encourage to bring back the cases as a success story uh, to the next IGF meeting. While there was not specific answer or response at that time, but several couple of stakeholders, uh, some of which may be panelist background, would be uh, expected towards the next meeting. For example, it is an existing activity in other fora of CSAT, and the other example would be a bilateral cooperation in broader context of information technology between two countries, for example, Japan and Vietnam. In the happiest case, it may result in the, uh, any specific commitment to the IGF, for example, dynamic coalition or any other um, cases. As a closing word, it is the greatest pleasure of us uh, to make a greater step of uh, for further collaboration in information security capacity building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I now have uh, Gurumurthy Kashinathan of the Dynamic Coalition on the Framework of Principles for the Internet. Thank you, Chairman, for this opportunity to report back on the Dynamic Coalition proceedings. We had a workshop yesterday on the Dynamic Coalition on the Framework of Principles for the Internet. Uh, we will give, of course, a detailed report on the proceedings to the Secretariat, but I'll just briefly share with you uh, what transpired and what the basic idea of this workshop was. Uh, the Internet and the Internet governance processes are still in a very evolving and a nascent stage, and uh, a need was felt by various people belonging to civil society to look at framing a broad set of principles that would actually help and underlie the very process of internet governance itself. The IGF is basically a forum where we get multiple, multiple stakeholders to come, discuss, participate, and hear views. It doesn't have a substantive outcome as its mandate itself. And various issues come up. There are contestations, conflicting claims. It would be very useful to have a broad set of principles that would underlie what would be the mechanisms of understanding and reflecting on these issues so that we can take forward a more fruitful uh, process of uh, acting on it. So that was the basic idea of forming this particular dynamic coalition, which met in Athens. The first IGF was when the first meeting of, the, of this dynamic coalition was held. And yesterday we had the second workshop. The participants are primarily from civil society. I am Gurumurthy from IT for Change, which is one of the participants. We have uh, Ken Lohento from Panos, uh, John Mathiasen from the Syracuse University. We also have uh, Professor Zia, Zia Feng Tao from the Chinese government. And uh, the, the discussions began yesterday by John Mathiasen actually outlining what I said, that the principles would be an excellent base for IGF actually to take forward its own work. And uh, he mentioned issues such as the expansion to IPv6, the issues of ICANN reporting to the US government, the need to interpret issues of standards, whether the technical standards or public policy standards, all these required some kind of underlying base for interpretation and taking forward. Uh, the question might arise, how come a group of civil society actors are taking upon themselves the whole burden, so to say, of defining the framework of internet principles? We have an ex excellent example before us of the Disability Caucus, and Sylvia from the Disability Caucus came and shared the experience of the Disability Caucus in framing a similar convention for the disability rights. And uh, she spoke about the various dynamics of that whole process, that it is very time consuming, it requires enormous interaction with several uh, stakeholders, persistence over a period of time, and uh, that we should actually view this whole process as equivalent to the framing of a new constitution. Ken, of course, highlighted the need to go back to the business principles so that we don't reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of principles out there in the business documents and in the Tunis uh, documents which talk about uh, some of the principles that can underlie this uh, framework of principles for the internet. Professor Tao talked about the new uh, 
world internet norm document that have come out with which underlines some of the principles that they believe is essential for creating the new order on the internet and uh, we had uh, uh, eric from peru who talked about the lima declaration so the various people who came up with different base documents that could be used for arriving discussing on the framework of internet principles there's also a lot of discussions on this uh, from the audience as well one person talked about the whole issue of enhanced cooperation and how that needed to have a stimulus to take forward in terms of taking it forward the group felt that we need to have regular discussions through a mailing list and through the creation of a virtual space and also maybe through face to face meetings and then of course taking it forward in delhi as well thank you i have emily taylor on the uk country best practice uh, workshop good morning i'm here to report on the uk country best practice workshop which was called partnership in practice and it looked at two aspects first of all how an enabling environment promotes investment innovation and a partnership approach to internet governance issues and also supports economic growth and competitiveness while ensuring stakeholder uh, inclusion and secondly the workshop featured case studies which looked at uh, a couple of players in the uk environment and then secondly focused on a uk igf experiment that we are undertaking in the united kingdom so first of all the participants came from a range of stakeholders we had the uk department of business the confederation of british industry the london internet exchange which was the first peering uh, point internet exchange point in the united kingdom and nominet the dot uk registry we looked at the government's uh, attitude towards regulating the internet and then which is a light touch uh, creation of an enabling environment rather than direct regulation and then we moved on to looking at the two not for profit uh, membership organisations the london internet exchange and how peering and internet exchange points have massively reduced the costs of getting online and provide perhaps a model for reducing access costs in other parts of the world and also nominet a not for profit registry and the effect of price reduction over the years and how that had promoted growth the second part of the workshop focused on the uk internet governance experiment and first of all we brought messages from uk stakeholders a meeting was held in october and more than 100 attendees gave us messages for rio they emphasized that the most important and relevant igf theme for a uk audience is security but that for the global de development of the internet access is the most important issue we also they also wanted the igf to focus on positive experiences and partnership approach rather than on direct regulation or recommendations the workshop looked at a competition held by nominet the best practice challenge and the results are exhibited down in the village square here as are the actual comments made by the uk stakeholders there were a number of questions from the audience there were about 60 or 70 people present people were reflecting on how transferable are these lessons and one message that came through clearly was the direct transferability of the concept of internet exchange points in reducing costs and promoting access but otherwise the emphasis was not on telling people what to do or how to behave but on providing ideas that they might want to adopt or not depending on their local environment there was also a reflection on how the re the the relationships between stakeholders have evolved often through quite animated and often sometimes hostile uh, discussions moving towards general understanding of perspectives and the issue of child protection was discussed as well in this context the conclusions of the independent moderator uh, were that there was a, actually an impressive consensus amongst the different stakeholders private sector civil society and government 
But the things are still evolving, they're still in a state of flux, and the roles of the relevant parties are changing. For the private sector, in the moderator's view, this meant a higher degree of responsibility for social matters that they might otherwise have preferred to ignore or merely regard as a potential cost. And likewise, the public sector is transforming too. It might have to become, in her words, more laid back regarding interventions. Overall, the, the sense was that this is a continuing, changing environment, and sometimes it is unclear who should take the lead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and next, I have Eloy Rodriguez, who is going to report on a workshop for the Portuguese-speaking community. Bom dia. Eu venho apresentar o relatório do, do workshop do seminário sobre acesso livre ao conhecimento científico, a expressão em inglês é conhecida como Open Access, que se realizou aqui no âmbito da IGF no dia 13 de novembro. No dia 13 de novembro realizou-se com sucesso o seminário organizado pelo Instituto Brasileiro de Informação em Ciência e Tecnologia, ligado ao Ministério da Ciência e Tecnologia, IBICT, as apresentações e os debates de alto nível técnico discutiram os temas do acesso livre ao conhecimento científico nos países lusófonos e o multilinguismo. O conteúdo de todas as apresentações está disponível no sítio eletrónico do IBICT. Estiveram presentes representantes de Angola, Brasil, Cabo Verde, Guiné-Bissau, Moçambique, Portugal e do Secretariado Executivo da Comunidade dos Países da Língua Portuguesa, CPLP. Em breve reunião que precedeu o seminário, tais representantes trocaram impressões sobre as perspectivas de articulação dos países de língua portuguesa para a promoção do acesso livre ao conhecimento científico e o fomento à produção e ao acesso a conteúdos digitais lusófonos. Desse breve debate, importa destacar a concordância sobre a necessidade de que ações concretas de cooperação, ainda que na forma de projetos piloto, ocorram de maneira paralela à consolidação do diálogo político sobre o assunto. Nesse sentido, resultaram os seguintes consensos. Estabelecer o diálogo técnico com vista à formação de uma rede permanente de instituições dedicadas ao tema. Promover esforços junto aos respectivos governos para a identificação, no mais curto espaço de tempo possível, de pontos focais nacionais a quem caberá coordenar esforços e intercambiar informações para criar condições técnicas para a assunção do compromisso nesta área entre os seus respectivos governos no âmbito da CPLP. Entender que a proposta do Governo brasileiro, intitulada Protocolo de Intenções entre os Governos Integrantes da Cplp para a União de Esforços, no sentido de compatibilizar suas bases de dados e informações em acesso livre, como forma de facilitar a disseminação e o acesso à produção científica e cultural originada nos países de língua portuguesa, constitui uma base sólida para futuras negociações tendo em vista o aludido compromisso sobre o acesso livre ao conhecimento científico nos Estados-membros da Cplp. O IBICT do Brasil e a Universidade do Minho de Portugal comprometeram-se a oferecer assistência técnica para a promoção de iniciativas nesse campo nos países integrantes da Cplp. No final da reunião, todas as organizações presentes reafirmaram o seu empenho em trabalhar para conjuntamente promover a expansão dos repositórios de acesso livre no espaço da Cplp. Thank you very much. I now have Tiago Tavares, who's going to report on a workshop on measures to prevent and fight child pornography on the internet, strategies for developing countries. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will speak in Portuguese. Uh, o workshop foi realizado pela Secretaria Especial de Direitos Humanos da Presidência da República Federativa do Brasil, pela Comissão de Direitos Humanos e Minorias da Câmara dos Deputados, pela Seifernet Brasil, representando uma sociedade civil aqui no Brasil, pela Procuradoria Federal dos Direitos do Cidadão, do Ministério Público Federal, e, contou, e também pela Clarity, 
Children's Clarity Coalition on Internet Safety, do Reino Unido. Uh, e contou também como convidados a Associação Brasileira dos Provedores de Acesso e Serviços à Rede Internet, Abranet, e também a Associação InHope, uh, da Irlanda. Uh, discutimos uh, as implicações do crescimento exponencial da pornografia infantil por meio da internet e, particularmente, uh, o recente movimento de migração de redes criminosas que atuam no leste europeu e em países uh, como Rússia para uh, países uh, da América Latina. Estamos uh, muito preocupados com a crescente uh, utilização da internet nos países uh, em desenvolvimento, particularmente uh, no Brasil e outros países latino-americanos, por usuários que utilizam serviços internacionais para distribuir em larga escala imagens contendo cenas de sexo explícito envolvendo crianças. Uh, no Brasil, uh, nos últimos 20 meses, nós constatamos mais de 50 mil casos envolvendo a distribuição de pornografia infantil por brasileiros através de serviços prestados por empresas internacionais. Nos países em desenvolvimento, não existe uma, uma, normalmente não existem sedes das grandes empresas e de grandes provedores de internet. De modo que as, os serviços são prestados remotamente e existe uma grande dificuldade das autoridades eh, brasileiras, especificamente, na obtenção de informações e na obtenção de dados necessários à comprovação da, da autoria do crime e, portanto, eh, essa dificuldade eh, dificulta a, punição, a identificação dos criminosos e a punição desses criminosos. Eh, por fim... Uh, sugerimos que os países da América Latina criem uh, internet hotlines e estabeleçam mecanismos de cooperação no âmbito judicial e no âmbito policial e que também desenvolvam iniciativas objetivando a harmonização legislativa uh, dos diferentes ordenamentos desses países. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. I now have Rob, uh, Robin Gross, from, who's going to report on the Dynamic Coalition on Access to Knowledge and Free Expression. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Robin Gross, and I'm the Executive Director of IP Justice, which is an international civil liberties organization that works to promote balanced intellectual property laws. Um, I'm going to report back on yesterday's se session on the Dynamic Coalition on Access to Knowledge and Freedom of Expression. It's called A2K at IGF. The focus of this Dynamic Coalition is on the impact on access to knowledge and freedom of expression from overbroad intellectual property rights. Uh, we had a number of speakers uh, yesterday uh, in our session. Uh, Susie Struble from Sun Microsystems, she spoke about the role of open technical standards in providing access to knowledge. Brad Biddle, who's a senior attorney at Intel Corporation, she, he spoke about the impact on secondary liability rules on innovation and competition in the digital environment, and also on the economic value of robust limitations and exceptions to intellectual property rights. Uh, there was a co-presentation from Adon Katz of Yale Information Society Project and Ronaldo Lemos from the Getulio Vargas Foundation. And they spoke about some country-specific case studies that they had done on access to knowledge. Pedro Peranagua Monez, also from the Julio Vitargas Foundation, spoke about the impact of technological restrictions to enforce copyright and digital rights management systems, or DM, DRM, on access to knowledge and freedom of expression. Mary Wong, who's a law professor at Franklin Pierce University, provided us an analysis of the anti-circumvention measures of digital locks that are contained in bilateral trade agreements. And she also provided some recommendations for policymakers who are negotiating intellectual property rights rules in these free trade agreements. 
And our last uh, presenter was Natasha Primo from the uh, Association for Progressive Communications, and she gave an overview of some global civil society efforts to promote ICT for access to knowledge. If anyone is interested in learning more about our coalition, our website is www.a2k-igf.org. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I have Peter Van Rost from, uh, who's going to report on the best practice forum on one size fits all. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter van Rosten. I'm the general manager of Center, the European uh, regional organization that groups the CCTLD registries. I'm reporting back on um, the session, the best practice forum um, titled One Size Doesn't Fit All. This was a joint session organized by Center, uh, APTLD, LACTLD, and AFTLD. We were able to get five um, high-level speakers from, the, uh, from five domains that, um, that were a model for the different approach that is taken in um, the different uh, countries. We had speakers from South Africa, from Austria, from Japan, from the .eu domain run by URIT, and from Chile. These models, um, as I mentioned before, symbolize the whole range of different approaches that have been taken in different parts of the world. .za, the domain for South Africa, is a not-for-profit organization that was redelegated as recently as 2005. And the focus of the presentation was on the current restructuring of the .za domain and how the new structure will allow .za to efficiently tackle a whole range of challenges. Austria is run by an organization called NIC AT. It is uh, a for-profit organization, but interestingly, the profits are transferred to a, a not-for-profit organization who, uh, who uses the surplus integral, integral for the uh, benefits of the local internet community. The Austrian government uh, does not see any reason to uh, manage or regulate uh, the .at registry, in particular because the domain is run efficiently and in the interest of the local internet community. Uh, particularly worth uh, mentioning is the NetID initiative, which allows members of the local internet community to uh, apply for sponsorship for their own educational initiatives. Japan is run by a, a for-profit organization, a private for-profit organization, and the registry is based on a sponsorship agreement with ICANN and the government endorsement. So there is no contractual relationship. The surplus is again used for educational projects and the operation of one of the root servers. .eu is a registry under contract. Uh, the legal framework is based on European regulations and the manager of .eu demonstrated that his model allowed for the creation of a successful registry in a uh, truly international environment. The last presenter uh, from Chile, Margarita Valdez, uh, was able to demonstrate that um, .cl is a prime example of a, a university-based registry. Um, even though working as part of the government um, and in an academic environment, uh, .cl was, um, was able to, to minimize bureaucracy and provide an excellent service to, uh, to the local registrants. Then after a highly interesting and uh, interactive Q&A session, the, uh, the independent moderator, Janet Hoffman, uh, was able to conclude that the different local needs require different solutions. 
and the models that were presented, that were presented convincingly demonstrated that there is no such thing as a global best practice in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Mire. Uh, I now have uh, David Dekele, who's going to report on a best practice forum on multi-stakeholder partnerships. Thank you. I'm re reporting on best practice forum on multi-stakeholder partnership organized by APC. I'm reporting on behalf of Valerie Da Costa, who unfortunately was not here uh, for the reporting. Uh, the session explored how, well, how multi-stakeholder partnership, MSP, work in practice by highlighting a number of case studies in India, Ethiopia, Nepal, Kenya, and the LAC region. Uh, these MSPs were diverse in their reach and purpose, ranging from community technical network efforts to engaging the media to a nationwide plan to wire up India. It was noted that although different stakeholders have unique interests and perspectives, MSPs can work effectively when the value proposition for each party to collaborate with the others is clearly spelled out. Each party must have a sense of the value of engaging other stakeholders and must be able to articulate how participation in the MSP helps them attain their goals. This value proposition for all parties to engage on one another for mutual benefit was also described as creating a win-win scenario. There must be a realization that the, the other stakeholders provide a unique and valuable input or perspective which helps each stakeholder attain their own goals more effectively. It was noted that for MSPs to work, a champion or broker is often needed. Some felt that civil society best played this role. The broker is one who brings different parties together and provides a neutral forum for collaboration to take place. All panelists reiterated that successful MSPs take time and effort and are hard work. Given the multiplicity of views, it is a big effort to bring those views together and into a cohesive whole. All participant, uh, participants agreed that for MSPs to work in practice, trust was critical. This trust is only built over a period of time. After hearing how MSPs were started in Bulgaria and Ethiopia, it was noted that MSPs can be learned behavior. In particular, governments that are not used to engaging other stakeholders in transparent participatory process could learn the value of these processes by starting small with less controversial topics and by getting used to engaging other stakeholders via less formal venues such as tea sessions and informal chats. Thank you. Uh, we are running a little over time, but since we are not going to have any further session, that we just we have, have three more, so we'll try and accommodate that. Um, Abdullah Diakite of AFNIC is reporting on a workshop on worldwide NICs for development. L'atelier dont je vais vous présenter le rapport porte sur une success story sur le co-développement d'un outil de gestion automatisé d'un registre de CCTLD. Les noms de domaines de premier niveau géographique national. Il s'agit de registres nationaux d'Internet de petite taille par le nombre de noms de domaines et par les ressources dont il dispose, mais qui ambitionne naturellement de grandir ou devenir aussi compétente 
aussi compétent, aussi euh, diversifié que les grands registres géographiques des principaux pays et que des grands gestionnaires tels, tels que Affilias, Nominet et autres. L'atelier a mis en exergue le co-développement au sens du génie logiciel, puisque la solution a été co-développée depuis la conception jusqu'à la réalisation et au déploiement, mais également au sens de l'approche philosophique, sociale, économique du co-développement conçu comme un moyen d'aller ensemble, d'avancer ensemble. Ont été impliqués dans ce projet plusieurs pays, la Côte d'Ivoire et le Madagascar en Afrique, Haïti dans les Caraïbes, l'Albanie et la France en Europe. L'outil prend en charge plusieurs politiques de nommage, d'enregistrement et a une caractéristique importante, c'est d'être réalisé avec des logiciels libres. Il est actuellement déployé dans certains NIC, dans certains registres, et il est en cours de déploiement dans d'autres. La session a été suivie avec attention et intérêt. De nombreuses questions ont été posées et des pistes de collaboration sont attendues. Le plus important est que la solution clé à main dans le projet a été évitée pour privilégier l'approche co-développement comme je le disais, depuis la conception jusqu'au jusqu déploiement, en passant par les phases de codage, de test et d'implémentation. L'expérience mérite d'être dupliquée dans d'autres domaines en tant que mécanisme puissant de renforcement de capacité par l'appropriation scientifique et technique comme moyen stratégique d'aller de l'avant. Merci, M. le Président. And now I have George Sadowski, who is going to report on a workshop on root servers. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm reporting on the workshop that was held yesterday afternoon on the root server system. Uh, as you know, uh, the root server system is an essential part of the domain name system. Uh, it uh, is essential in resolving domain names, and therefore, if we're going to use domain names, we have to have a root server system that works, works well, works reliably, and does not fail. Uh, we had six presenters. Uh, the first three talked about this root server system itself, and the second three uh, gave uh, their experiences regarding the uh, implementation of uh, root servers in various parts of the world. Uh, the uh, first speaker, Desiree Milosevic, described the root server system in general, and it was interesting. One of the things that came out, I believe, during her talk was that some people, uh, when they hear the word root server system and are not necessarily English speakers, they spell root, R-O-U-T-E.